So today, um, it's a bit low. Today, I'd like to discuss the unique challenges facing consumers in Southeast Asia, uh, the products in the market, and the trends surrounding these products. Towards the end of the presentation, deliver some um, predictions on what I think is next and how other markets around the world could learn from Southeast Asia. So uh, Asian Consumer Intelligence was founded 10 years ago in Tokyo and we're now based in Singapore. We work in three areas, as Rana said, which is strategic research, trend forecasting and innovation consultancy. What this means is we offer all kinds of strategic research. Um, we do everything. We try to do the more interesting, I think, forms of research. For example, we do smartphone online quant. Um, so we could do 3,000 people in 15 markets. And just recently, we did something on uh, uh, millennials, 200 millennials and Gen Z in 15 markets on their flavor preferences, for example. And we also run more intimate forms of research. Um, actually, this is one of our specialties. We really love doing ethnographic research, um, home visits, guided shopping, and all that sort of stuff. And uh, last month, we did a very large uh, piece of research where we um, visited millennials in their homes in Jakarta, in Bangkok, in KL, and, um, and in Manila. There's four markets. And that was actually for one of our fragrance uh, clients. And, uh, and really, it was to understand um, changing category preferences. And just very briefly, what we found was that 18 to 22-year-olds in these particular cities were actively seeking niche fragrances. And we're actually spending as much as 10% of their income on these fragrances. So huge ramifications for fine fragrance and obviously uh, the other categories that could be taking market share. Um, so in addition to consultancy, we also run a members-only trends platform, and, uh, and this is updated every single day from reports from my um, researchers in the region. They're dotted through the key cities. And uh, so I think it has a, a truly unique perspective on consumer consumption and product trends. And uh, yeah, so basically what this really means is that we're always taking a proactive uh, view with our research, rather than waiting for a project, we're always constantly looking around what's new, what's hot, why is that happening? Okay, enough credentials. Um, let's get back to the presentation, which is actually why you're here for inspiration. And um, let's just really start with this obvious chart, shall we? Um, it's, uh, you know, here's a picture of one particular city's temperature in uh, KL. And also, I'm actually going to talk a little bit of anecdotal um, evidence too, as well, as well as some of the consumer research. So I'm going to bring in a lot of things to talk about. But anyway, based on this graph, I wanted to start with the obvious, um, which is the actual environment of Southeast Asia, which creates the unique challenges for skin and hair, um, and subsequently the products that need to be developed in order to deal with this region's unique climate. Um, so this chart shows the region's climate, which is classified as tropical. Um, it's, actual, it's actually uh, KL's annual rainy days as well as its climate. But to be honest, this really could be a graph of uh, Jakarta, Bangkok, Singapore, or Yangon, as climatically they're very similar. Okay, I'm not a weather person, but why am I talking about weather? Well, all Southeast Asian countries share a very similar climate pattern. It's either hot, hot, it's either hot, it's either hot and raining, or it's raining and hot. And there's very little variance in between. And this contrasts with, say, Japan, where I lived for 12 years, um, which have four seasons. Um, and so to put this in a very relatable way, um, I moved from a country where um, you could get away with washing your hair in the winter probably every three days, to a region where even washing your hair twice a day sometimes doesn't feel enough due to the humidity. Um, so what happens if you don't wash your hair pretty much every day in Southeast Asia? Well, consumer research, anything online, and experts, and uh, all the evidence is out there that will tell you that people's scalps get so itchy that it actually becomes quite painful. And on top of that, we live, I live in a region where hijabs are common, and that can also cause um, a damp environment for scalps, which creates even more itch. So fundamentally, we're starting with this idea that your hair and your scalp um, is a, a very damp, 
itchy place. So there's also, a, as far as I'm concerned, a, a large misconception when it comes to hair care, um, particularly um, in this region. I think there seems to be, from the clients I work with, that Northeast Asia, the Europe, and the US are more advanced than Southeast Asia in terms of hair care trends. But actually, I think there are truly cases where I find that consumers in you know, Philippines, in Malaysia, in Thailand, in Singapore, Indonesia, are certainly way more advanced than their counterparts in the West, which I think for some people are probably thinking, uh oh, where's she going with this? But I think this is partly driven by the number of factors that I mentioned earlier. So if you have an extreme climate which produces constantly greasy, oily scalps, you have a larger awareness around hair fall, um, which is a large problem in this part of the world. And on top of that, there's a large demand, particularly in places like Malaysia, for treatments that offer moisturizing benefits, as well as locally, there are very folkloric style treatments that are rooted in ancient medicine, so the whole scalp um, spas and so on and so forth. And, um, and on top of that, there's a huge demand for modern treatments that offer scientific, scientific benefits using naturally positioned ingredients. So for me, it's this idea that we have this huge number of factors coming from a different directions, which is driving the trends in this part of the world. And because there is so much demand to solve these issues, um, I think that there's a lot more new product development happening in this part of the world than I see in other markets. And that's because everyone is so um, everyone is looking for solutions to their hair care problems. Um, and originally, because many of these products, if we think about the mass market products and even the professional style uh, you know, treatments that were offered to market originally, none of them were delivered or originally created for Southeast Asia. So what I think really is quite interesting nowadays is that Malaysian hair is so naturally beautiful because of the amount of effort and care that people put into taking care of it, that it's actually become the most in-demand um, kind of hair among African-American women who use it for weaves. So Malaysian hair is actually one of the most sought after types of hair. Anyway, random fact there. So I want to talk little, a little bit about culturally and what hair means to um, consumers in this part of the world. It's such a fundamental part of the beauty here um, that there are actually huge superstitions around hair, um, which actually range from, in my opinion, quite silly through to, you know, stuff like there's, there's actually superstitions in this part of the world that if you go to bed with wet hair, um, it could cause blindness. Or if you cut your child's hair before they turn one, um, it will give them a shorter life. Or actually still commonly held is if you cut your hair on Thursday, that will bring you a lot of bad luck. So these are actually uh, commonly held superstitions which are still quite prevalent in Southeast Asia. Now obviously younger consumers don't believe into these suspicions as much as their parents or grandparents do. But what I think is interesting is how in the weeks preceding Lunar New Year, um, hair salons in Malaysia and Singapore actually add on a China. They believe that by cutting your hair, you will also symbol symbolically cut any chance you have for prosperity in the new year. And they also believe it's not actually good to wash hair in the first few days of the lunar new year, as it's possible that you're going to wash away all your good luck. So that's actually still uh, a belief that's very commonly held even among young people today. So while some of the older superstitions that, you know, you might go blind if you go to bed with wet hair are being forgotten, um, the one that relates to fortune is definitely still prevalent and growing. And in fact, if we think about, you know, as I mentioned earlier with the salons adding on their additional fees, um, when it comes to hair treatment salons in towards the new year run up, that's actually said to be the period when they make, make most of their profits in that chunk of time the month, the month before. And uh, so I think from a strategic point of view, it's actually a very smart time to launch new products and services in the run-up to Chinese New Year because you actually have a captive audience who are quite willing to experiment at that time. Okay, so earlier I mentioned the advanced attitudes to hair care in Southeast Asia. 
And I'll explain what I mean by that now. So in salons across Malaysia and in Singapore, and also in other Southeast Asian countries, it's very, very normal to find a hair salon that also offers a wide range of treatments. And so these, these treatments run from deep moisturization through to repair, through to treatments that also tackle hair loss. It's also quite common to be confronted with very, very technical looking equipment when you walk into these salons, kind of like large machines and, and cameras. And, um, and I'll go into detail with that later. But it's very, you know, it's, you walk in, there's a machine, there's a, a menu of services, which is as long as your arm. And it, basically what we're seeing is these salons address every aspect of hair care through um, cut, color, perm, through to all the scalp treatments, all in one environment. So let's contrast this with the West, where generally speaking, hair salons are places where the majority of the services focus purely on the aesthetics of a haircut, right? It's a hair, it's a haircut, it's a color, it's a perm. It's purely aesthetics. Then, so if we think about if a, a typical consumer has a hair issue, right? If we think about them, if they have a, a hair weakening issue or hair loss, then if we think about the user experience of what will happen, that consumer, generally speaking in the West or even in some markets in, outside of Southeast Asia, will probably end up going to the supermarket or to the drugstore to find a shampoo or a treatment which addresses this need. Then they'll purchase a number of these items, um, they probably won't work, and then if it's a really big problem, they will actually then investigate and start to look at a hair specialist or a trichologist. And uh, a trichologist, I think, uh, I think most of you know this, uh, it was originally invented in the UK, but they're hair and scalp specialists, and technically they're skin specialists. Um, and what they do is they diagnose the causes of, of hair, felt, hair fall, um, hair breakage, hair thinning, and diseases of the scalp. And obviously treat according to cause. So it's not a cheap process, and already you've already started to think of it as a, a, a very different methodology to just going to the hair salon. Um, some of these places will charge, you know, like 90 Singapore dollars. This I'm equating it back, sort of, uh, you know, 100 US dollars um, to go see a hair specialist in places like London. And that doesn't usually include any treatments. But the key to understand is that already this process is disease treatment oriented rather than preventative. Okay, we already go into it from a, I have a problem, how do we solve it? And that's the fundamental context here. In Southeast Asia, hair treatments are a regular part of the hair care salon experience. Consumers visit the hair salons, they receive a wider range of hair services that run from the aesthetics um, through to more sensorial and relaxing, such as the head massages and the scalp cleanses. And then they also have the problem solving, such as fixing damaged hair or hair loss. So salons in Asia are more holistic management centers. And this allows a consumer to use a salon as a one-stop shop and a place where they can problem solve, relax, be pampered, and achieve a better look through a new cut or all the other aesthetic treatments. So there are a few drivers to what differentiates consumer behavior in Southeast Asia than other markets. But a key one, I believe, is convenience, which is a key driver, I think, for a lot of trends we see in Asia anyway. Southeast Asian hair salons are the equivalent of the beauty salon. This, if you went to the beauty salon, you go in and it would be one environment where you have everything to do with skin care, um, be it problem solving, if I had acne or uh, a, an issue, or it's relaxing, I can just go in and get a lovely mass, uh, facial massage. And so while beauty salons offer a range of services that are aesthetic through to more invasive, hair salons in Southeast Asia are taking a similar approach. So it's this, as I mentioned earlier, it's this one-stop environment that offers anything hair-related under one roof. And it just basically removes the inconvenience of having to go to different locations. You don't have to find a specialist product. You don't have to find a trichologist. You can just be in one environment. 
So these all-in-one salons tap into deeper Asian thinking, which is taking a preventative rather than a problem-solving approach to addressing hair care. So if we go to the salons to get our facials and our, to keep our faces toned, sorry, we go to the salons um, to get facials to keep our faces toned. I mean, if you, if you do uh, any treatments in this part of the world, it's always about the facial massage to lift your face. Um, we visit the gym to tone our bodies. And in Southeast Asian hair salons, we visit them to keep our hair maintained. And that's the key word. And so when you explain it like that, or when I explain it like that, I think it makes you wonder why salons in the West don't actually focus on good hair maintenance and instead position their offerings around just a nice cut. So in my view, that's why I think salons in this part of the world are way more evolved. So just as skincare has been influenced by gourmet ingredients borrowed from the food category, Hair care, I believe, will also continue to see the same language, icons, and ingredients borrowed from healthier um, ingredients from this category too. And this is obviously driven by the, un you know, the, the continued driver for natural. Um, but it's also that idea about detoxification as well. Obviously, in this part of the world, people are more concerned about the environment. Um, people are trying to take a more of a proactive approach to um, fighting UV and, and, you know, infrared issues and obviously um, pollution. But also, I think we're going to start to see, you know, we already see it already, but kind of more and more of the ingredients that we see in smoothies going into shampoos. Um, you know, whether it's, and I think the, probably the most emergent ingredients that I'm seeing right now are wheatgrass, uh, medla, which is also known as goji berry in China, dates, chia, um, acai, perilla, I think that's going to come through a bit more, watermelon and prickly pear. And actually, the reason why is because these are all very much emergent in the food category as well, where we also do a lot of our work. And these are very resonant with millennials as functional ingredients. So your typical millennial consumer is, consume, is drinking their smoothie because they know it benefits their bodies, but they're also looking for very similar ingredients because they know it will benefit their hair and skin too. So within the category, we'll begin to see the same trends that we've seen with skincare, and they're becoming equally applicable to the hair care category. For example, the obvious ones, such as more claims around UV protection, more claims around anti-pollution, pollution removal, um, city defense. But there's also going to be more evolved ideas, I believe, such as antibacterial therapies, as well as a closer, con closer connection with the communication focused on the climate and its impact on scalps. So I think that going forward, we're gonna see more glosses, more masks, more protective coatings being applied to hair as a last line in defense as consumers leave the door in the same way that we're having people are putting on um, last line of defenses on their skin. But we'll also see consumers making the link between aging and hair issues more and pursuing these treatments that provide, that deep, provide deeper moisturizing benefits and anti-aging hair serums. And in particularly markets such as Thailand, um, China, Korea, and Japan, which have very, very rapidly aging um, you know, populations, these are to become more and more needed by consumers who are experiencing hair loss, hair fall, and want to do something about it. And I think also within that, something that I'm starting to really see more is there's almost um, a disconnection between your scalp and your hair. And this, again, what makes a consumer a bit more evolved in this part of the world. Generally speaking, I think in the West, the there's, there's a tendency to link the scalp and the hair. But here, people are starting to separate it and see the scalp purely as your skin and your hair as something else. So I think m maybe another way of seeing that is if you're a man and you have a beard, you would treat your beard differently to the um, skin on your face. And that's how the consumer is moving to in this way. So they'll want scalp-specific products as well as hair-specific products. And these two will have different benefits and functions. So the concept of hair washing becoming a two-step, so sorry, wrong slide up, here we go. 
So for me as well, I think we'll see the evolution of um, hair washing becoming a two-step or even three-step process. Um, and this is a very new opportunity area, I believe. So it's the equivalent of a double cleanse. And, uh, and obviously, if we look at this um, example from Japan, um, this is actually positioned as a pre-shampoo. And what we really like about this product launch is it's basically a double cleanse for the hair. And, uh, and obviously, if we think about where double cleanses came from with the whole rise of K-beauty, um, we could s start to see this happening here too. So this product um, came out a few months ago. It's called The Zero. And basically, what it seeks to do is undo the damage caused by harsh chemicals, sun exposure, and silicon residue. And it was actually inspired by the conversations the manufacturer's president had with um, hairdressers. And the hairdressers were actually expressing their annoyance at having to um, shampoo hair two or three times just in order to uh, allow a treatment or a color to be added to, to the customer's hair. So the Zero's formulation is paraben-free, which is obviously a must-have in this part of the world now. And it also contains, which is another you know, area we've seen a lot and lot of growth in, the idea that there's 23 different types of natural plant um, extracts. And that's, and that's been a, a trend that we've been covering for a long time now. So this combination, um, actually, of this product, actually ena enables the easy breakdown of silicon coating and promotes, it claims to promote, the regeneration of hair follicles. Um, it's got a great fragrance as well. It's got a very natural bergamot and peppermint fragrance. And, um, and basically, what really makes it interesting is that customer or consumers are advised to apply this shampoo to dry hair and then leave for two to three minutes and then rinse before their regular shampoo. So the next slide shows um, a salon called Shortcut. And uh, for me, it's a new type of salon. Um, it's a trendy looking barbers and, um, and it features a football in its entrance area. And it has a menu of salon services aimed at men. And, um, and so it's a, it's a, a male, male salon of barbers. And it's basically, um, it offers the usual shaves and haircuts. <laughs> right, okay, so this is Shortcut. Um, and so as I mentioned, it's a, it's a barbers in Malaysia. And so it has this really cool football table in the entrance. So they're actually growing quite rapidly. And um, so yeah, it has the usual menu of salon services, aimed at men, has the usual shaves, it has the usual haircuts. But what's really interesting about this salon is that it offers, and this is only for men only, this is not for women, um, it offers two male-oriented treatments for hair, which are proving really, really popular. The first one is a black mask, and, um, and then it also has detox and apple stem cell treatments. And these are effectively, you know, um, thick treatments that are applied to the scalp. And I think really what this salon and its growth and its popularity is proving is obviously that men are just as concerned about their hair as women. I think we've always known that. Um, and particularly in some parts of the world, there's a lot of identity, particularly from masculine side, which is tied up to having a good head of hair. And, um, and so what we're really starting to see is it's not just women who are signing up for these multi-treatments or hair maintenance, but men are moving into this territory too, showing that they're actually open to the idea that they are willing to spend more money. And again, you know, they're looking at the deep scalp cleansing, they're looking at the application of serums, and they're using steam to open the pores of the scalp, which is said to clean the scalps more effectively. Here's another actually example, which I think is uh, very, very interesting as well. It's called Hair Depot, and it's a Malaysian hair specialist store, and it has an online and offline presence. It's actually a franchise business. Um, it has a thousand products focused on hair only, and as well as in-store equipment to diagnose scalp troubles. So, as I mentioned earlier, these machines are very, very common in salons in in. Singapore and Malaysia. And what they do is they take a highly magnified image of the scalp. I haven't put a photo up there because it really isn't very pleasant to look at. But they take um, a highly magnified image of your scalp and they show the hair follicles. And the stylists, they might not be, you know, I know they're not trichologists, but as far as I'm concerned, um, they do a pretty good job in emulating what a trichologist may do anyway. And from the consumer perspective, they seem just as expert. Um, 
But what they do is they diagnose the treatments that can be undertaken to either restore the scalp or restore hair to its full glory. And I think really the way to view these machines and their continued growth is that a bit like when you first used to go into the department store or a beauty salon and they get those scary looking machines out and obviously P&G has them now. It's really just the same thing. It just allows the consumer to understand what's happening on their scalp more effectively and see for themselves what the issues are. And this, of course, ends up probably scaring a lot more consumers into buying products than they probably would. So to summarize, um, here are my key predictions in Southeast Asian um, hair trends. So as we've already seen, salons are shifting from not only places to get a haircut, and the reason why is because, obviously, from a revenue perspective, it offers the salon a lot more opportunity to make money. And I, will start to, and I really believe we'll start to see these open in the West as well. Secondly, more emphasis on male scalp products that follow a holistic product to keeping scalps healthy in a preventative rather than a, pure, uh, rather than a cure treatment plan will also evolve. So right now, if you think about the majority of services aimed at men, it's always you have male pattern baldness, it's always the cure rather than the solution. So I think we'll start to see more marketing and product development shift on the preventative rather than solution only. And thirdly, the introduction of these machines I talked about earlier. And these offer the opportunity to offer on-the-spot diagnosis and, um, and, I start, and I really believe that we'll start to see some of the more branded or sorry, well-known salon brands such as Kerastase and Tresemme offer these as well in an attempt to own this category. And lastly, I think we'll start to see these, more of these pre-steps in the shampoo ritual as consumers look for products that double cleanse and even triple cleanse to remove the pollution from their hair or to beat environmental issues. And of course, I don't think it would be uh, um, out of the realms of possibility to believe that actually microbiome will start to affect this category as well. And it will be that consumers are starting to look for personalized, created formulations that tackle their hair issues and not just generic, all-in-one solutions. So thank you.